Like, you would think that eating an incredible homemade meal night after night after night would get old. No, you just keep getting better and better. <laughs> this is incredible. Thank you. Dad, can I have some more veggies, please? You bet. More veggies for the big guy. All right, whose turn is it to help me with dishes tonight? Me, 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 me. All right, you both can help me. Yes! I need a, a, a like, a 20-piece chicken popper <laughs> I'm trying to win the <laughs> Well, it is good to see all of you today. If you're new, my name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff here at Hope Church. And to begin, I want to introduce you to a word. It's probably going to be a brand new word uh, for most of us, but I'm just curious. Quick show of hands. How many of you have ever seen or heard this word before? Anyone? Okay. Nobody. Perfect. Um, this word is actually from the German language. That's why you've never seen or heard of it before. It's a German word, and... Um, so I'm going to try and pronounce it. My, my German accent is terrible, but, I, but I've learned if you just try and sound angry when you speak German, it's pretty close uh, to what it's supposed to be like. Uh, the word is Trampelfahrt. Trampelfahrt. Let's all say that. Ready? Trampelfahrt. All right. Speaking in tongues, we are charismatic this morning, filled with the Spirit. Trampelfahrt is a German word, and what I love about the German language is if they have something and they don't have a word to describe it, they'll just take two other words and slam them together, or three or four words, and slam them together to make a new word. Trampel is the word that means to stomp, as in stomp your feet. You can see our English word trample, very similar. And the word fad means path, stomp path. Now, you might have no idea what that's referring to. We don't have an equivalent in English, but you'll know it when you see it. This is a trampelfad, a path through the woods or through a grassy field where people have walked so many times that it is beginning to form a dirt path. Uh, in the summer months when it's warm, I love to take my boys hiking. If we don't have much time, we'll just go over to Lapham Peak. If we have more time, we might go down uh, to the Scuppernong area of the Kettle Moraine Forest or do a section of the Ice Age Trail. And when we do, we're always marching or hiking on a trampelfad, a place where enough people, enough footsteps have walked that it has formed a path. And that makes hiking so much easier than having no path. Imagine every time you wanted to go for a hike through Lapham Peak, you just had to blaze your own trail through the woods and figure it out. That would take a lot more energy. Now, there's a different kind of trampofad that we're going to talk about today, and I promise I'll stop saying it soon. Uh, and it is the one that exists in your brain. Your brain is filled with approximately 100 billion neurons. And these 100 billion neurons create a dense ecosystem in your brain. Now, neurons are the cells in your body that receive and transmit electrical impulses. So if you decide to pick up a donut and take a bite, your brain is sending electrical signals through this neural forest to get the message to the different parts of your body to take the right actions in order to get that yummy goodness into your belly. That's what's going on. Now, when you do or try something for the very first time, there's no pathway, which is why when you're learning a new skill or a new talent, it takes quite a bit of focus to figure out how to do that thing. But after you've repeated it a number of times, it becomes easier and easier to accomplish. This is the reason why it takes an incredibly high amount of focus for a 16-year-old to safely back a vehicle out of the driveway and get it to the store. But when you're in your 30s, uh, there are days where you're not even sure how you got to work that morning. That's the power of trampofad. Um, uh, 1949 neuropsychologist David Hebb said it this way, neurons that fire together wire together. The more the brain sends a signal to perform a certain action or think a certain, a certain thought, the easier it becomes for the next signal and the next signal and the next signal after that. Now, if you want to see how this works, um, it would be effortless for you to mentally recite the alphabet while I'm speaking up here. Go ahead, write in your mind, do it now. A, B, C, D. Go ahead, just keep going with the song in your mind. Do you want to sing it out loud? No, okay. So if you just do that, I, you can mentally make it all the way through the alphabet right now while I'm talking, and you won't miss the thing I say. Why is that? Because 
You have recited the alphabet so many times, it's a well-worn pathway through the brain. It's very effortless for the electrical signals to go down that path. However, if I challenged you while you are sitting right here, now recite the alphabet backwards. Z, Y, X, V, no, W, V, X, right? You'd have to focus on it. And the reason why is your brain has not gone down that pathway unless you're really into sobriety tests or something like that. I don't know. Your brain has not gone down that pathway. And because it's not a well-worn path, it takes focus and effort to accomplish that task. Now, if you went home and every day you practice for 10 minutes, I'm going to recite the alphabet backwards, you could come back next week and you could rattle it off. Why? Trampofad. Your brain has taken that path through your neural forest many more times, making it that much easier. Now, here's what's interesting. God designed your brains to work this way. And the reason why is because if we had to focus on everything we did without develop the ability to develop habits, we would hardly be able to get anything done. We would be so focused. We would work so hard mentally just to do basic tasks. For example, tonight, instead of brushing your teeth with your dominant hand, Try brushing your teeth with your opposite hand. See how much focus that a normally effortless task requires when you just do something as simple as switching hands because it's not a habit to brush your teeth with that hand. God made us that way so that we could execute consistent tasks without expending much energy. In fact, God made us that way so we wouldn't expend all of our mental energy making basic decisions all day long. Did you know that approximately 40 to 45% of the decisions you make every day aren't actually decisions? They're habits. You don't make a decision, should I shower this morning or not? Okay, should I eat lunch today or not? Should I go to work today or, well, some of you might wonder that. Um, should I go to work today or not? They're just habits. And those habits save us the energy so that we can focus our minds on more important tasks and decisions that we need to make. However, what God gave us as a strength can easily become a weakness. We can develop unhealthy habits. We can develop addictions. And just like healthy habits, like going to the gym every day, become self-reinforcing habits, unhealthy habits or addictions are the same way. The more your brain sends a signal down a certain path in your mind, the easier it gets to send that signal a second time, just like walking on a well-worn path through the forest. That's why habits are important. If 40 to 45% of your decisions and actions every day are nothing more than habits you've developed, that means habits are very important in your life. In fact, um, habits, your habits determine the outcome of your life. See, we think the outcomes of our lives are determined by the big decisions, like should I take that job or, or you know, should I ask her out? And those are important. Those aren't unimportant decisions. But the true outcome of your life is more heavily influenced by the habits you develop on a daily basis. If you develop a habit of reading 30 minutes a day, that's going to impact the outcome of your life. If you develop a habit of reading your Bible and praying for 30 minutes a day, that's going to impact the outcome of your life. If you develop a habit of being kinder to your significant other, that's going to influence the outcome of that relationship. A famous billionaire investor, Warren Buffett, credits his success to one key habit. Uh, you've probably heard of Warren Buffett. He's the third wealthiest man in the world. His current net worth is approximately $70 billion. What's more amazing, I think, by the way, is that in the last 20 years, he has given away $40 billion, and he still has $70 billion. That's just amazing. He attributes his incredible success to one daily habit. Do you know what that is? He spends 80% of his workday reading. He reads about businesses, reads about companies, reads reports, re just reads all day long. And that allows him to make the best investment decisions that he can make. His habit of reading has literally paid dividends in his life. That's why habits are important and your habits determine the outcome of your life. Well, today we're going to apply this truth to your family. Uh, the name of the series is called Ideal Family, and all series long, we've been saying that no matter where you're at with your current family situation, there's one thing that all of us have in common. You, in your mind, have a version of what an ideal family would look like, and then there's your real family that you live with every day. But God also has a version of an ideal family for you. 
and what that would look like. And then there's the real family you have every day, and there's a gap between the real and the ideal. Well, have you thought about what it is that's causing that gap to begin with? Why is there a gap between your real and your ideal family? A lot of the answer has to do with your habits. It's the behaviors of the people you live with, and it is your behaviors that cause the gap. Simple as that. It's the behavior of the people in the family that create the gap between your real and ideal family. And so much of our behavior is driven by habits. That's why today we're going to talk about the importance of establishing the right habits in family life in order to shrink the gap between your real and your ideal family. Uh, let me give you a quick uh, review of where we've been at in this series. Uh, research have discovered that basically there's three critical traits that if you can develop these in children, uh, they'll pretty much be okay for life. They'll pretty much be well-adjusted, healthy adults in life. And they are social competence, emotional resilience, and spiritual resilience. Social competence simply means they can have healthy interchange and relationships for their age. Emotional resilience simply means when life doesn't go your way, it doesn't throw you off course, you can bounce back. Spiritual resilience means there is a God in heaven and I am his child and my purpose is to glorify him and I'll glorify him and enjoy him forever when I die. Children who develop these three traits are children who grow up into adulthood basically able to handle the challenges of the real world we live in. Now, to help instill these, we've noted that there are five C's to focus on when it comes to raising kids. If, if you just focus on these five dashboard gauges, you'll pretty much be okay. The first one is care, providing physically and emotionally for your children, care. Consistency, this has to do with the home environment that you create for them. And, and a couple of weeks ago, uh, we said the best way to do that for parents is you love God first and you adore God first. God is number one. And then you adore your spouse second, and then the kids come third. And what that does is it creates a safety and a security for those children, knowing that there's a God in heaven, and he's in charge, and he loves us, and my parents love each other, or if you're divorced, my parents still speak highly of one another, so my world is secure. That's how kids know they are well-loved, and their world is going to be okay. That's how you provide consistency. Last week, we looked at choices and consequences, that life is filled with choices that you make and the consequences that follow them. And just got a lot of good comments on the message last week. By the way, if you want more information of what we talked about last week, there's a great book I'd recommend. Uh, it's a simple read for parents. It's called Boundaries with Kids. Boundaries with Kids, it's by um, John Townsend and Henry Cloud, Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, great book, uh, Boundaries with Kids. Today, we're getting to the last C of parenting, and that is Christ, Jesus. To raise kids to know that God loves them so much that he sent his son, Jesus. And because of Jesus, God is a father in heaven who we can always run to and jump in his arms. God is a father in heaven who's not trying to be vindictive or to get us because of our failures. But there is a God in heaven who calls you his child and has such an amazing purpose for your life and an incredible future that's so much better than you can imagine for you. We need to pay attention to this dashboard gauge. And to pay attention to it, we are going to tie the idea of bringing Christ into your home with the power of habits in your life. And here's the big idea that we're going to talk about today if you're taking notes in your program. This is our first fill in the blank. When God is part of your family's routine, God becomes part of your family's reality. It really is as simple as this. If you want God to be part of your family's reality, if you want the grace and forgiveness that comes from knowing God, if you want the peace and ability to deal with life as it comes, if you want that in your family, that comes when you decide, well, we're going to make God part of our routine. We're going to make God a habit in our lives because when God is part of your family's routine, God becomes part of your family's reality. Now, for some of you in the room, you would say, I know, I believe it, Jason. This is why we go to church. And for some of you in the room, the fact that you are in the room this morning, that's amazing. 
For so many of you in the room, you're a first-generation Christian. You are a pioneer. You are doing what was never done in your family of origin, and you are coming to church. Or for some of you, your story is, well, I went to church when I was a kid, but as soon as I turned 16 or 18, I never went again. I was so glad to get out of there, and now you're back, and you're, you're even bringing your family back. And, and that's amazing. That, that is so amazing that you've taken that step. Because maybe you didn't have any role models in this area. And, 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 and I, I'm proud of you, and we care about this. We put a lot of energy into what we do when we gather on the weekends. Unfortunately, however, that's not enough to make God part of your family's routine. In fact, some of you, part of your faith story is that you grew up in a home where you were taken to church every Sunday, but that's where God ended. You jumped out of the car, you walked into church, and your parents pretended everything was fine and they were great and the marriage was great and the family was great. And as soon as you walked back out of the church, the dysfunction began right where it left off. Now, there's a reason for that. I want to break this down so you can see it. What we can do with you and your kids and Kids Connect, because we put so much energy into Kids Connect, we care about those kids and their future and their relationship with God. But basically, we get about 40 hours a week with your kids whether in Kids Connect, whether in 412 students, we get about 40 hours a week with your, a year, I'm sorry, a week, <laughs> a year with your kids. Kids Connect staff is like, we're doing what now? Um, <laughs> 40 hours a year. Now, you might go to church 50 times a year. You might go to church 20 times a year. I don't know. But if we average it out, let's say it's 40 hours over the course of a year. Now, by way of comparison, the average American child spends 750 hours playing video games a year. Some of you are like, no, that one should be weak. That's 750 hours a week. No. Over the course of a year, the average American child spends almost 20 times the amount playing video games, 19 times, as they do in church. Now, here's what's more interesting. If you take all of the available unstructured hours that your family has, the hours where you're not sleeping, let's assume you sleep eight hours a night, I know you don't, but let's pretend you do, um, and let's pretend that you know, after you take care of you know, going to work and all that stuff, do you know how much time there is to figure out what to do with the rest of your family life a year? About 3,000 hours a year. Now, if you use your 40 hours a year to get your kids and to get your family into church, that is awesome. That is an important first step. But you are not tapping into the full potential of how you can make God part of your family's routine so that you can make God part of your family's reality. Now, here's what's amazing. Centuries ago, long before we knew anything about the brain and how it worked and the hundred billion neurons in there and how we can establish these well-worn pathways through our brain by repeating behaviors or repeating thoughts, the biblical authors understood this idea. And they understood that if you want children who grow up with spiritual resiliency and who grow up following Christ, the way to do that is to instill the habit while they are still young, instill the routine while they are still young. And one of the places we're going to look at in the Bible today is from a book of the Bible called Deuteronomy. Uh, let me give you a little bit of context before we jump in. Uh, last summer, we talked about the life of a man named Moses. Uh, we did a couple of series on his life, actually. He lived such a, a long life, did a lot of amazing things. Uh, the most famous thing he did in his life was uh, when the Israelite nation was a slave nation held in uh, economic and social slavery and oppression, Moses went to Egypt and said, let my people go. That's what God says. He, the ten plagues came and he led them out of Egypt into the desert to be free from their oppressors. Now, God said, great, Moses, you liberated them, they're free. Now you're going to take them to the new land, the new area where they will settle and be a free people and their own nation. So Moses is like, great, let's go. Well, when they got to the land, they said, let's send out some spies to kind of spy out the land, see what we're up against, because it wasn't an empty land. There were already people who lived there. So 12 spies went into the land. They scouted everything out, and then they came back with their report. And they said, well, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is this place is amazing. Okay? We've never seen anything like this. The, the, the produce, the grapes, they grow so big. Uh, it's flowing with milk and honey. It's a beautiful place. It's a spacious place. It's everything we ever could have dreamed of. Well, what's the bad news? Well, people live there, 
and they're really big, and they're really strong, and they're well-armed, and they have walled cities. We're never going to defeat them. Well, the people, when they heard this report, they got upset. They got mad at Moses. They said, why did you bring us out into the desert to die? We were better off when we were held against our will as slaves in Egypt. And God said, hold on, time out, everyone, time out. See, I promised that your, you people would have this land. That was my promise I made to you. But since you don't believe me, and since you're not acting on what I promised you, I'll just wait 40 years until you all die off, and then your children can go and take it. They'll believe me. And that's what happened. So they spent 40 years just kind of walking through the desert on this long camping trip. God's like, I got time. I live forever. I'll just wait for you all to die off. And so eventually they did. 40 years later, an entire generation of people died off. At the end of the 40 years, Moses gathered all the people together. He was a very old man by this point. And he said, all right, listen up. Now that your parents are all dead because they were so stubborn, God is ready to give you this land. Are you ready to go take it? And they're like, yes, sir. We are ready to be done with our camping trip. They are ready to go take this land. Moses said, good, but before we do, I've got a sermon series to preach to you. And the sermon series that he gave them on that event, right before they crossed the Jordan River to enter this new land, is what we call the book of Deuteronomy. It's basically a series of sermons that Moses preached to the people. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he touches on the importance of making God part of your family routine so that God can be part of your family reality. Here's what he said. He said, these are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. So Moses said, all right, here's all the commands God has for you because when you walk into this land, you are going to encounter a new kind of people and they are godless. They do not worship the Lord, but I want you to worship me and continue to follow me. And these are the commands that I don't just want you to know, I want you to teach them to your children so that they can teach them to their children. God is a God who thinks in terms of generations. All throughout the Bible, you see that. Uh, In fact, God often referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's a guy, his son, and his grandson. And we see the pattern repeated here. God's intention, God's design, is that parents would teach their children who would teach their children to keep the decrees and commands of the Lord. Not just talk about them, but keep the decrees and commands of the Lord. And the keeping is the critical part. In fact, uh, if you're taking notes, uh, here's the point. What parents do is more formative than what parents say. Okay, some of you had parents who would say stuff, but they, they, they weren't, their actions weren't congruent with what they said, and it had no weight on you. In fact, it possibly turned you off to what they said. God said, parents, I want you to keep the commands and decrees of the Lord. And in this, your children will learn to keep the commands and the decrees of the Lord. What we do is more formative for our children than what we say to them. So Moses continues with the sermon. He says, hear, O Israel, another day, listen up, because I guess when he preached, people fell asleep. I have no idea what that would be like. Hear, O Israel, and be what? Careful. This is not going to happen by itself. You need to take care. Be careful to obey so that, the result, if you obey God, so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. In other words, God didn't say to the people, the reason why I want you to obey me is so that you can be my people. God already made them his people. He already delivered them out of Egypt. He already established a covenant with them saying, I will bless the world through you. He already did all that just because of who he is. He says, but now that you are my people, I've got some commands and rules for you to keep. Again, this is like I said last week, this is why I make rules for my kids. I don't make rules for your kids. And I don't make rules for my kids to make them part of my family. I make rules for my kids because they're part of my family. And I love them and I want them to thrive. And I want to teach them boundaries in life. 
God's the same way. God has wisdom. God designed life. And God already made you part of his family through Jesus Christ. When Christ died on the cross to forgive your sins, he said, you're part of my eternal family. That's how much I love you. Then after that come the rules. After that come the commands. Why? Because you're part of the family. And because he wants a great future for you. And because he knows how life was designed. And if we are going to experience true and full human life, flourishing. It comes by living our lives in accordance with the will and plan and intention of the designer. Here's how I'm saying it in the fill in the blank. Obeying God makes you better at life. It really does. It doesn't make life easier. God never promised that. Jesus said just the opposite. He said, in this world, you will have many troubles. You'll have many sorrows. But it will make you better at life. It will make you more competent. It will make you more spiritually and emotionally resilient to handle life. And that's what God promised the people. I want you to obey me so that it go, may go well with you and you may enjoy long life in the land that I'm giving you. Moses continues. This is the most important verse, by the way, in Hebrew scriptures, um, even to this day, if you ask a Jewish person what's the most important verse in the Hebrew scriptures, this is it right here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Now, as a complete aside, God's mentioned three times because we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what he says is the Lord is one. They were heading into an area that was religiously pluralistic. They believed in those ancient times that there is a God for every people and every nation and every group and the God of the sea and a God of the land and a God of the wind and there's a God of the rain. There's a God for everything. And that's no different than today. Today, we say it a little differently. We say, hey, whatever you want to believe, great. Whatever is good for you, go for it. I mean, don't insist that anyone else believes what you believe. That would be wrong. That would be oppressive, but hey, whatever you want to believe, you go ahead and believe it. Isn't it a little bit narrow to say there's only one view of God that's the right view of God? I don't know. Would it be narrow to say there's only one you that's the true you? What if um, I talk about you when I have coffee with my friends? What if I talk about you and I say, oh, you mean Jimmy? Yeah, I know Jimmy. Yeah, the way I like to think of Jimmy is that he's brilliant at math and terrible with relationships. Real dumpster fire. Been divorced seven times, I think. And Jimmy might say, wait a minute, that's not true. A, I'm terrible at math, and B, I've been married to one woman my my, my whole adult life. We're happily married. Yeah, but I like to think of you the other way, Jimmy. Jimmy. You say, you can't do that. There's only one true you, isn't there? Yeah. Well, shouldn't we at least treat God with the same dignity? The same level of respect to say, well, there's only one true God, so who are you? Maybe instead of projecting what we want onto him, we discover and listen and find out who he actually is so that we can know the one true God. Because there is one true God. And this is so critical in our lives, and let me tell you why. If you take your thoughts and you project them onto God so that God is whoever you want Him to be, there will come a day in your life when you just feel like a worthless person. And I can assure you that a God that you made up can't do anything about that feeling. There will be a day in your life when you are racked by guilt because of what you've done. And on that day, a God that you made up can't do anything about that. There will be a moment in your life when you are peering over the edge of your mortality into whatever comes next. And I promise you, at that moment, a God that you made up will not give you any assurance. Not only is it reasonable to understand, we need to go and discover who this one true God is, it's also the only God that can help us 
when we feel worthless, when we feel guilty, when we're wondering or concerned about what's next, or, or when fear creeps into our hearts and overshadows him. This is a great thing that there is one God, and Moses says you need to discover and listen to and obey who this one God is who made you and loved you and designed you. He continues with the most important response, love, love the Lord your God. He, he is the one true God. He made you. He has an eternity for you. So love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. We say, how can you command someone to love someone? Because love isn't an emotion. It's an act of the will. I love you with my heart. In other words, you're most important to me. With my soul and with my strength, with what I do, with, what I, with who I trust. He says, that's the appropriate response. Love God. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, not on your behavior. God wants your hearts. Impress them. Imagine you have soft wax and you're, and you're pressing a shape into it. Impress them on your children. He doesn't say, let children grow up and decide to believe whatever they want to believe. He says, no. There is one true me. Impress the true me onto them that they might know me. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Do you see what he's doing here? He's talking about the rhythms of your day. When you're at home sitting, when you're on the road walking, when you go to bed, when you wake up, talk about these things. Impress these things on your children. Here, here's what God is saying in all this. God wants to be part of your daily routine. That's how he wants to be part of your family's life. He wants to be part of your daily routine. When you get up, when you sit down, when you wake up, when you go to bed, when you're eating, when you're enjoying each other, God wants to be part of your family's routine. Now, let's get practical on this for a minute. I don't know what season of life you're in. Uh, if you have little kids, big kids, no kids, nieces and nephews, I don't know where you're at. But I want to give a few tips of what this looks like, practically speaking, at different stages of life. Um, life begins with the early childhood years, you know, birth through age two, maybe, let's call that early childhood years. The first thing to do at this stage is to normalize it. Decide right at this stage, we are going to make God part of our family routine. Even if you didn't grow up with that, even if you've never seen an example of that in your life, you just decide right out of the gate, this kid is born, we are going to make God part of our family routine, and that will be normal. See, one of the things that parents bump into is if you don't make it normal now, I have parents come to me when their kids are teenagers, and they feel at a loss because they never normalized it at this stage. Uh, to which I'll say, well, just normalize it now, but there's so much more resistance that you feel when your kids are older. So just decide early childhood years, kid comes home from the hospital, we're going to make God part of our family routine. Now, what does that look like when you have a one-month-old? Seriously, how do you make God part of your family routine? Two simple tips, prayers and blessings, prayers and blessings. You establish a routine with your kids. When they eat, when they sleep, they're, they're, they don't follow it always, but you develop a routine that you follow. So integrate God into that routine. Every time they go down for bed, you speak a blessing over your child as soon as they're born. What does that mean? A blessing is when you speak God's truth over someone. You are loved by God and his child. That's a blessing. God loves you and he has a plan for your life that will bring him glory. That's a blessing. Every time you put your child down to sleep, speak a blessing over that child. That will make it normal. They don't understand it yet. It doesn't matter. This is as much for you as it is for them. And it's a powerful thing to speak a blessing over your child. Also, prayers. Bedtime prayers, mealtime prayers, whatever it is. Can they understand? No. But you can still take their hands and pray with them. And make this part of your family's routine. That's early childhood years, all right? Next come the preschool years. So about age three, age five, maybe six, right around there. Uh, strengthen those routines, but this is where you add to them things like children's Bibles. 
Try out some different bi- children's Bibles. Ask people in your small group what they like for a children's Bible. What have they found? I've got some I like. You can always text or email me or ask me. I'll give you some recommendations. Uh, go on Amazon. See what good ranking children's Bibles are. And just decide, hey, we're going to have a bedtime routine. We're going to have a dinner time routine. Whatever it is, we're just going to take three minutes to read a children's Bible. That's all it takes to read the average children's Bible story. And they're going to learn about God. You say, Jason, I've never read the Bible. I don't understand anything about it. So here's what you do. If you don't know anything about the Bible, when they go to bed, you get that children's Bible out and you read the next day's story and you'll be ahead of your kids their entire life. And they're going to say, wow, you know everything about the Bible, Dad. You always know the story before you even read it. You're like, I know. One day ahead of my kids. That's all you need to be, okay? So, so, So this is where you start bringing children's Bibles into it. This is also a great time I'm going to talk more about this next week, for what we call highs and lows. So at dinner time or at the end of the day, hey, what was the best thing that happened today? Tell me about it. What was the highlight of your day? What was the worst part of your day? Well, you know, what was something disappointing that happened today? Now, the reason why that's important is you're going to use that and give thanks to God for the good things and ask for his blessing in the bad things. You're teaching your children at a young age that God is to be thanked for everything good and we are to seek his aid in everything bad and to know that even in our bad times, God still listens to us and cares and answers us. What do you think that's going to do for their emotional resilience? Start that young, make that normal, build those routines. Next, elementary school years. Um, Elementary school, about into middle school, you just start to integrate this pattern and routine you've established, and you see as they get older and their brains start working on a higher level, all the different angles and places you can bring it into everyday life and talk about it at a higher level. That's the key. Talk about it. When dinner comes around, um, you can talk about their highs and lows. Well, what do you think about that? What does God think about that? And just make it normal conversation in your home to talk about those things. The three-year-old, they're not going to have a lot of interesting things to say, but by the time they're nine or ten, they're going to have some really interesting things to say about that, and you can guide them through that. Uh, Teen years, this one's tough. Live it. Schedules get crazy in teen years usually. Um, And and the routines at home, it might be hard to have dinner together, even five nights a week by the time you're in your teen years. So find ways to live it out. Get involved in the church. Volunteer together. Do things together. Just be nice and kind and thoughtful for people. When you make brownies or cookies for your neighbors, say, we just want to share a little God's love with them. And you live it out in their lives. Now, you don't... You, know, you don't want to stop doing these things as you get to new stages. You want to add on and layer it as you get to new stages and new seasons of life. This is just, and it's not complicated. It's just a matter of making a decision. We are going to make God part of our family routine. And when you decide to do that, God will become part of your family's reality. And when it comes to raising healthy kids... Here's why that's important. Spiritual resiliency. Knowing that God is part of our life. He is a God who loves us. He's the God who made us. He's the God who redeemed us. He's the God who has a purpose for our lives. He is the God who will lead us through all of our trials. Spiritual resiliency builds emotional resilience. So it's going to be okay when life doesn't go my way. And it builds social competence. Because I'm not the center of the universe. God is, and my purpose is to love him and love my neighbor as myself. And that's what creates healthy adults. Next week, we're going to wrap up this series. At first, I was going to call next week's message the kitchen sink because I'm just going to throw everything out. Everything else I still have, I'm just going to dump it out next week. It might not be much of a sermon, but it will be interesting, so I don't think you want to miss it. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, I know that for some people in the room right now, uh, they're thankful because this was the home they grew up in. You were part of the family routine and it has blessed them in their lives so much. Father, for many of us in the room, we've never seen this modeled. We've never seen an example of what this looks like and we feel so incapable or incompetent. Today, I ask that you would show everyone that we can do this. And the reason why we know we can do this is because you entrusted children to our care. And you would not have done that unless we were capable of doing that. So give us the courage to get over ourselves 
the courage to get over our fear of inadequacy, and today take a step to make you part of our family routines so that you would become part of our family realities. This won't just glorify you, it will bless us and it will bless the next generation. And you do have a big purpose for their lives and we don't want them to miss it. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.